about randomization to allocate scarce life-saving resources, which of course, in this time of COVID and second wave is a very timely, timely question. So we hope to uh, see you for this event next uh, week. If you're interested, go to the center's website and register by clicking on the Zoom link in the calendar on the center's website. We're using Zoom webinar, which means at this point you can only see the uh, uh, three of us, Alex, myself, and Simon. But if you have a question for Simon during the Q&A, please just write your name in the Q&A, uh, click on Q&A at the bottom of your screen, write your name, and I will promote you to the status of panelists so that you can directly engage with, with Simon and not, um, and that's going to be a simpler solution. Today, it's my uh, great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Simon Dedeo, who is a friend of the center, and we've had uh, the pleasure to see him over the years, and it's always great to uh, have him back. Uh, Simon is assistant professor in the Social and Decision Sciences Department, I believe, at Carnegie Mellon University, which also has other affiliations, including Santa Fe Institute uh, and the Complexity Science Hub in uh, Vienna. He's published extremely wide widely on um, a very diverse range of topics, which is one of the uh, amazing things with Simon's work is that it actually reaches out to many different questions, published in cognition, for example, on, on Darwin, published in TNAS, in, it's published in physical review. Uh, so it's really have uh, an, an extremely, and he has actually a paper coming out in Trans Cognitive Sciences, I, I believe, if uh, the, your CV is up to date. Uh, <laughs> and so it's published extremely wide on a range of, of, of topic in the history of science, in the social studies of science, in issues related to physics and complexity, to uh, chaos, to also understanding uh, various issues in cognition. Uh, so that's uh, an impressive range of, of, of interests. Um, and today, uh, Simon will be talking about explosive proofs of uh, mathematical truths. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Edward. So I'm just going to boot up my, uh, my presentation here. Do -do -do. Share screen. Um, that's not one. Um, it's working. So hopefully, um, uh, Edward, do you do you just see one uh, slide there? I do. Excellent. I do. Very good. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and I'm just going to move your gonna move this over here so I can see everybody. Um, so this is wonderful. Thank you, obviously, very much for coming. Uh, I wish I could see you in person. I cannot see you in person, so I am speaking solely to my screen. Um, they are uh, rebuilding my apartment building right now. Um, so this is like Otto Neurath's boat, right? They're going to see if they can actually rebuild it while I'm inside it. So hopefully it won't be too noisy, but if it is, I will do my best to yell over the, the drills. Um, I'm going to talk today about some work that we've done sort of at the intersection of the cognitive sciences, psychology on the one hand, a uh, little bit of the social sciences, but obviously a big chunk of what I'm going to talk to you about has uh, a, a enormous philosophical import. So it's obviously it's very really exciting for me to be able to talk to real philosophers, right, as opposed to people who just philosophize uh, sort of accidentally when they when they justify themselves to themselves. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the questions, the Q and A. Um, I'll be reasonably brief on all this. This is work that um, we did or I did with Scott Viteri. Scott uh, was a uh, pre-doctoral fellow um, at the uh, Laboratory for Social Minds here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, as you can see um, from this image, Scott is a computer scientist and he's now actually doing his PhD in computer science at uh, Stanford, which is a good university on the West Coast. Um, the paper, you can read this paper if you like. Um, uh, the, the thing I'm going to present today, it's available on the archive and it should be really soon in resubmission. So we're rather excited about that. Um, so uh, proofs, right? What are proofs? Uh, proofs in some sense are the essence of mathematics, right? Mathematics is more than just a set of claims about abstract objects, right? We knew the Pythagorean theorem before Pythagoras, but you might say we didn't really know it, right? Uh, for most of us, including, I would say, our departments, at least of pure mathematics, if not applied mathematics, what makes mathematics mathematical, as opposed to, let's say, philosophical or scientific, is this kind of special status that uh, mathematical claims get when they're supported by the proof task, 
right? So a proof tells you not just what we believe, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared, but also gives a set of reasons for why we ought to believe this thing. And the nature of those reasons, the way in which those reasons fit together is the essential question of this talk. It's the essential question, I would say, of the philosophy of mathematics. And it's not just of interest to those of us who you know, are somewhat interested in this you know, rather rarefied bit of, of human performance. Um, for many people and many anthropologists, uh, Robert Bella is the one I, I sort of go to on this, um, the discovery of the idea of a proof, right? This creation of a new, somewhat mysterious epistemic norm, something that tells you not what to believe, but how to sort of go about believing things in general. Um, this discovery is an innovation in human culture on the order of the invention of monotheism or the very idea of a transcendental order, right? So this is a major discovery in human life the Pythagorean theorem is as important as, let's say, the books of Moses uh, or the writings of Confucius. The other thing that's kind of crazy, I mean, we've done work in the history of science, right? Science is a baby, right? Science starts, what, Francis Bacon, 1600. We've been doing mathematics for 2,400 years, right? And to a certain extent, the Pythagorean theorem, that proof is just as comprehensible to us now uh, as it was to them then. I mean, obviously there are some gulfs there, there are some gaps, but, um, and I don't know, maybe Phil Kitcher will get mad at me on this. There is, we don't have any kind of major incommensurability problem in the way we do with, for example, comparing the, you know, alchemical system to the theory of chemistry. When we look at what Pythagoras is doing and when we look what Andrew Wiles is doing when he proves Fermat's last theorem, we see a continuity here. There's something about proofs that we can try or at least hope to talk about and understand. So then we say, okay, so look, exactly what happened when proofs were first invented and what's been going on since is a mystery, right? There is this commensurability, but exactly what's going on is, I would say we don't really know what's going on when mathematicians prove things. Uh, and in particular, what is it about a proof that gives it this kind of special status over and above you know, the kind of reliability we, we believe attaches to scientific claims or philosophical claims. Right? So hidden in that question, what's the deal with proofs, I would say are at least three separate questions. Right? First, we have a question in, I would say, psychology and cognitive science about how we form beliefs about mathematical stuff. Right? So you know, how do we think about numbers? How do we think, uh, how do we generalize? How do we do analogies between one structure and another structure. So these are questions I would say in cognitive science, not so much the philosophy of mathematics, although of course we want to understand them if we want to have a, a good theory or a good philosophy of mathematics. That's the first thing. The second thing is this question about how we construct proofs, how we discover mathematical proofs. And um, you know, philosophy of mathematics, they sort of stumbled upon this question uh, with proofs and refutations, really the first book in this. This is a, a kind of question we ask, what is mathematical creativity, right? The first question is how do we think about math stuff, right? The second question is what's the nature of mathematical creativity where creativity is thought about in terms of this special proof act. Third, and this is the question we'll be talking about today is how once these proofs are constructed by somebody, uh, how do we recognize them as proofs? How do we respond when somebody who holds a mathematical belief and who's gone through the relevant discovery process presents us a proof that she's discovered, right? What is needed to justify the claim that the final version is indeed a proof? So when we ask about this justification story, right? When we try to examine justification, we tend to end up in one of two poles, right? So the first pole is this kind of deflationary skeptical pole, which says that, you know, justification uh, in proof making, it's just like any kind of justification, uh, moral justification, bureaucratic justification. It's a social process, right? Just as the formation of mathematical beliefs is psychological, the production of a proof, the reception of a proof, the approval of a proof uh, may be simply social. So this is a naturalizing task. Um, it's something that I think has been done really well, not directly in the question of mathematics. Uh, by what we call the Paris School of Cultural Evolution. So these are the cognitive scientists who decided to boot up uh, a theory of cultural evolution to compete with the Californians. Um, what they have done is say essentially, look, 
the things we believe are separate from the reasons we give for believing them, right? Most of our beliefs are formed by automatic processes that are unamenable to introspection. Uh, reasoning, the reasons we begin to believe things, uh, the justifications we provide are actually a totally separate process. So I, you know, I, I whatever, I drink, I get, I get in touch with the platonic forms, I have mathematical beliefs, then some dork comes and asks me to justify them. And then this whole separate process of reasoning comes and it's essentially a social one, right? If I have enough social status, I can say it's obvious, trust me, it's the proof's too long for the margin, but you know, believe me. So that's, that's one poll, it's gonna kind of deflationary poll. Um, on the other side, uh, and this is the more philosophical side, right? Um, is the possibility that we might do a rational reconstruction, right? So never mind what we actually do, when we prove things, right? When we manage to get something published or we don't get fired for how we teach, never mind what we actually do, what's the best way to understand what we ought to do? Or, you know, what are we trying to approximate when we're, you know, being our best selves, right? Um, here are two sort of people I would say you might, you know, tag as being part of that rational reconstruction. I would say I am not a Frege scholar. I know there are Frege scholars in the audience, I'm sure, don't cancel me. Um, so, you know, someone like Frege will say the laws of mathematics are just shorthand for a set of claims in deductive logic. So as soon as you understand what mathematics truly is, you also understand what a proof truly is. It's simply a chain of valid logical deductions. Any mathematical fact is equivalent to the deductive chain that produces whatever this is, this kind of isomorphic structure, this structure that's isomorphic to whatever psychological belief you might have. So that's kind of a strong version, right? Frege, in many ways, you know, got this wrong, I would say. Uh, there's a weaker version that I'm going to just tag Alan Turing with, um, although, of course, many mathematicians at the time shared this idea of the possibility of a mechanical process for proof making. So this is a weaker version. It says nothing about what mathematical knowledge really is, right? But it does say that a mathematical proof is something that can be checked by a deductive and purely mechanical process. So if you read Alan Turing's account of what a Turing machine is, you know, he'll say, he says, like, imagine a mathematician and he's got a really long proof and he's like, check, check, yes, done, check, good, right? He's moving up and down his infinite tape. So these are the two poles, right? And of course, we could sort of stop there and we could say that the rational reconstruction task is fun. Um, but it has nothing to do with actual practice, right? We should be sociologists in mathematics. And, you know, that means looking at the social networks of how mathematicians do things, right? It's the kind of the, the sort of practical turn, similar to what we've done in, in uh, philosophy of science, turning into the history of science. Um, you know, we could say Frege's ideal notion of what justifies a proof Maybe it has its roots in Leibniz, right? Some ancient, more you know, primordial story. But fundamentally, it's just a made-up thing from the 20th century. Mathematical logic isn't even maths. Um, you know, Pythagoras did fine without any of this. So uh, you know, rational reconstruction has really nothing to do with what we really care about when it comes to the practice of proof making, which is where we began this talk, right? If we say that, you know, proofs are in some way a variant of philosophy, variant of poetry. They have different rules, but they don't have sort of pre-statable constraints in the way Frege tried to put on them on uh, how they might behave, right? So mathematics is an evolving thing with evolving warrants for belief. And to a certain extent, right, as a whatever Pittsburgh pragmatist, right, I am, I am definitely on board with this as a possibility. That said, um, it's certainly the case that many mathematicians take the story very seriously at this point, right? So maybe Frege just said what everybody was secretly thinking. Uh, if you told, so imagine, right? Imagine if you told a mathematician that you would prove Fermat's last theorem, but you also had good reason to believe that it could not in principle be reduced to a series of logical deductions, uh, you wouldn't be surprised if the mathematician, you know, threw you out of the office, right, was skeptical that you had any kind of warrant for belief at all. So the goal of this research now, um, the kind of refined goal, is to see what happens if you take this rational reconstruction seriously as an account of 
what mathematicians are actually doing or actually trying to do, right? So if you do this, and I learned this from Jeremy Avogad, right? If you do this, you almost immediately bump up against what I would call the paradox of proofs, right? So this is, this goes back, I, Kevin Zolman tells me Hume has a version of this, right? So Hume did it first, fine. Um, something like this is also sitting in uh, Phil Kitcher's book uh, uh, on, on mathematical knowledge, but let me just give you the argument, right? If you're like, okay, fine, Frege's right, uh, mathematical proofs are just a chain of logically valid deductions. Um, you know, here's my, here's an example of a mathematical proof. Okay, assume A and then A implies B, B and C imply D, but not D, therefore not C, right? Here's, you know, your proof's just getting up to speed. So you've got this long linear chain. So what I want you to do now is imagine that at each step in this deduction, you have some probability of making an error. Right, so that probability of making an error is epsilon. So epsilon might be, you know, 0 0.01, one percent chance every time you take a logical step, you screwed up. I think there's probably a logical step on this on the screen here, by the way. So if there is at any point a possibility that you've made an error, that possibility compounds exponentially. Right, it's sort of like eventually you play Russian roulette, you keep spinning the wheel, but eventually you're going to die. And you can actually compute how fast it's going to take you to die with some probability. Your chance of making an error is epsilon. This is the probability that your proof is correct. It turns into an exponential decay. The time scale for assuming that it's more likely than not that the proof has an error is about 100 steps if your error rate is 1%. It's 1,000 steps if your error rate is 0.1%. 0.1% is a pretty small error. Uh, if you imagine, uh, you know, giving somebody 1,000 logic puzzles, uh, an error of less than 0.1% means they get all of them right. So I'm not even sure if any of us can do that. Um, the, you know, this is a this is a problem. How can proofs give us the kind of certainty we we associate with proofs when the sort of rational reconstruction here, given a small amount of psychological reality, seems to fall apart almost instantly, right? Uh, it's even worse than this because mathematicians are no friend to you. Uh, here's uh, Henri Poincaré, right? Mathematicians love telling you this. They say, like, I can't even balance my checkbook. I'm so disorganized. I can't keep track of anything, right? So they, they go out of their way to tell you that they're bad at this sort of reliable accounting and, you know, sort of bureaucratic box checking. So where, where do we go from here, right? Well, the first thing to say is that, and I, Jeremy's not saying that this is you know, a linear thing, right? But the story I've told you is that proofs uh, follow this kind of linear chain that you, you know, go to a mathematics conference and a person is just reading the proof aloud in a one dimensional structure, right? Um, that's not the case. Proofs, of course, fall into uh, proof networks. So this is a little network we built. This is based off of Euclid's geometry. So Euclid, early mathematician, um, he, he writes his geometry. And one of the things he does is whenever he proves something, he talks you through the proof very carefully. And he tells you what other things he's assuming. You know, so proposition 12, well, you know, by proposition 11 and axiom one, one can prove this and this and this. So if each node here, so each node here is a proposition or an axiom in Euclid's geometry, uh, the lines between the nodes uh, connect deductive pathways. And uh, the arrows are really hard to see here. They're really, really tiny. But um, those arrows are directed. Uh, I've uh, made this network here. I've uh, laid this out with a network layout algorithm. Uh, I can't see if you guys are nodding, you know, out of sheer boredom from seeing these so many times. But if you haven't, um, I've laid this out. I've used what's called a spring loading uh, layout algorithm that kind of arranges all the nodes so that two nodes that have lots of connections, or in this case, lots of uh, common connections with other things are brought closer together. I've then colored the nodes on the basis of an algorithm that tries to find like clumps, right? So the blue clump and the purple clump, right? These are propositions that tend to, for example, have lots of common, uh, lots of assumptions in common. Um, you know, how well you know Euclid's geometry, I don't know. I can tell you the orange clump there, you can see that orange clump has a lot of connections within it. That's why it's kind of shrunk together, but it's actually not quite close to anything else. That's all of Euclid's number theory. So he's proving stuff about ratios, right? 
So um, happily, you could um, we you know we can get this proof network from Euclid, right? So the first thing we see is first of all, Euclid's geometry is not one long argument, you know, that leads to some inevitable conclusion. It's in fact a whole constellation of arguments that he's linking together and assembling over time. Uh, Euclid is really nerdy. He just is so anal. He tells you every single assumption he makes. Uh, Apollonius does the same thing. Spinoza, not quite a mathematician. Spinoza does the same thing. But most mathematicians are not that nerdy. So they won't tell us all of the things they're assuming. They won't lay bare the underlying logical structure of their uh, proofs. So if we want to look at proof networks on our way to understanding better how mathematical justification works, we have to, or we get to, turn to this new trend that's uh, happening now in the mathematical world, which is the use of automated proof assistance. So these days, uh, a certain subset of particularly edgy mathematicians, uh, when they prove theorems, they actually try to prove them uh, in such a way that it, it, it uh, indeed accords with Frege's rational reconstruction. And what I mean by that is that they write their proofs essentially as a piece of computer code. If the computer code compiles in the, uh, in the proof language, if the code compiles, that's equivalent to saying that the proof is a valid proof, i.e. that they have successfully proved something without making an error. So uh, there are a lot of these languages that now exist. They're based on something called type theory, which Bertrand Russell had to invent and Apple North Whitehead had to invent back in the day. Um, they are, um, if you're familiar with these terms, they are a form of intuitionistic logic. Uh, nothing is true unless it can be constructed. Um, but it is in fact today possible to look at a mathematical theorem and actually decompose it, uh, compile it, and look at, in some sense, the machine code of that theorem. Uh, that machine code can be then translated literally into logical claims, claims in deductive logic of some form or another. Um, Here's roughly, so Scott obviously explained this to me many times and I, I lost the thread many times. Here is uh, how a uh, automated proof assistant will prove that four is even, right? And you know, actually it gets even deeper than this, but here's roughly how it goes. So Scott proved this. There's many proofs that four is even. Uh, here's one, you know, step one, zero is a thing, okay? Successor on that kind of thing is also a thing. Zero is even, right? These are all axioms, right? A number that is the successor of a successor is even. All right, lemma, right? The sum of two even numbers is even. And then Scott has to go prove that, but that has a similarly kind of tedious thing. Um, therefore, therefore, uh, two is even, two plus two is four, therefore four is even given the lemma. That's the kind of ultimate tedium that happens when you try and even prove the most basic thing here. The automated proof assistant is mostly like a secretary that's sitting in the background as you sketch out the high level stuff. So here's kind of what it looks like. Uh, I find these stuff fascinating. Um, some people love it. Some mathematicians think it's the end of all math. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, zooming in on our paper here. Scott has just shown part of his proof that the sum of two even numbers is even. Uh, what I've highlighted there, Scott basically says, look, at this point, you machine, just go fill in the details and let me know if there's a problem. So these are called proof tags. So this is how it all fits together. Um, that's the network structure now that we get for the proof that four is even. So this is equivalent to the um, uh, to Euclid's geometry, roughly speaking, on some uh, sort of coarse grain level. That's the proof that four is even. Um, you may think that's you know a bit insane. Uh, they have proved Gödel's incompleteness theorem in Coke in the in the particular language we use. Uh, here is a partial decomposition of the underlying logical structure of that proof. Each of these nodes actually expands into some ridiculous number of sub nodes, right? So these nodes here aren't things as simple as zero is a thing, right? Uh, they expand much, much further down, but our computer just broke, right? Here's another one. This is actually a, this is a famous one. Um, this is the a proof of the four color theorem. The first proof, the first math, uh, the first mathematical theorem to be proved entirely by computer back in the 70s, controversial, right? Um, but again, you can see the structure here. And again, I've done a similar kind of coloring. You can see in the middle there, there's some mega node. That blue node is uh, clearly many, many things depend upon it. That's presumably some kind of axiom that's really important, something on the order of zero is a thing, right? So we can take these networks, they're enormous fun. 
Um, and we can do a lot of basic statistics on them, first of all. So let's just ask ourselves, for example, what is the distribution for any claim, any claim in a mathematical theorem, right? How uh, many things does it depend upon? So that's what we call the n degree, right? So I say, you know, zero is a thing. Well, it's an axiom, nothing. It depends upon nothing. I say the sum of two even numbers is even. Well, I got to assume some stuff. You know, I have to have, you know, put some stuff in to get that, right? So that has a couple dependencies, right? Um, you can look across all of the theorems in our database. And in fact, we have on the order of 50 machine proof theorems. Then we have Euclid's geometry. We have Apollonius's conics. Uh, we have Spinoza's ethics because look, gotta love Spinoza, right? It's not a mathematician, but he, at least he does the same structure. Uh, we find, first of all, many commonalities between the machine proofs and the human proofs, which is bizarre. In fact, statistically, they're identical. Um, if you look here, and uh, I can put this on the, ooh, I can't do my uh, cursor. Uh, the in degree for nodes is roughly less than 10. Right. So there are very few claims in either the machine proofs or the human proofs that depend upon more than 10 inputs. It's like if you've got more than 10 things going into your proof, make a lemma. Right. That's kind of the thing that's going on there. Uh, the out degree, however, how many things depend on you, not how many things do you depend on, but how many things depend on you is very, very different. And in fact, it has what we call a power law distribution, meaning that there's a small number of nodes that are extraordinarily important, right? So if you look at this plot here, you look at that solid line and the dots surrounding the solid line, uh, you can see there are dots out there. There are some nodes in Gödel's first incompleteness theorem that uh, have a thousand things that depend upon it. Like, I hope you didn't screw that up, right? There are a thousand things that depend upon it. So this is giving us some sense of the underlying structure of the rational reconstruction, let's say, right? Uh, we dug into this. I'm, I'm not going to go too far into this, but the way in which these networks assemble is uh, actually has a remarkable kind of generality. So when we first discovered this result, uh, one of the things we saw, you see that, you see the straight lines there? These are fitting the tail of the out degree, right? So they're telling you like how heavily weighted, right, are those really extraordinarily important things. Um, that tail across all of the theorems has the same index number, alpha equals two, right? The index of that power law, the slope of that tail is about two. Um, bizarrely, that's exactly what you find uh, when you look not at mathematical theorems, but you look at uh, computational projects, meaning like literally like the Linux source code, right? So you take all the files of an open source project, you know, this C code calls this C code, this C code calls that C code and so forth. The network structure looks actually very similar, right? Most things depend upon a few things, but there are a few mega important things. Uh, there's been some work done on this uh, to sort of understand how these things fit together, right? How, you know, why do these networks have such similarities? Uh, there's a, uh, a formation process, a kind of heuristic formation process called uh, the growing network with copying, uh, which sort of is a kind of story about how you put these things together. Roughly speaking, the mathematician's like, all right, time for a lemma. What are I going to use? Well, what do I got so far? OK, pick some of those guys. I'm going to use those guys. And then the guys I picked, right, ooh, what, what do those guys use? And pick a couple of those, right? So it's, you know, it's like, I'm gonna, I need to prove something in Euclid's geometry. OK, take some of those circle ones, OK? Oh, this circle one, oh, that probably needs that axiom. So take that axiom as well, separately, right? So uh, that very simple kind of cognitive mechanism seems to explain some of the gross properties of these networks. Um, I won't go too into you know, all, the beautiful, all the beautiful things here about this. This is like Santa Fe Institute nerd stuff. The one thing I want to show you, I mentioned this before, is that um, the alpha, this parameter governing the, uh, the importance of those heavy nodes, is uh, incredibly similar, almost within statistical error, between across all the machine proofs and then also uh, into the human proofs as well. So uh, Euclid's geometry proved by machine has at least 100,000 nodes. Alpha is 2.08 plus or minus 0.04. Uh, the human version, like literally you go to the ancient Greek text, uh, it's 1.97 plus or minus 0.07. So something is bizarrely similar here about how these proofs are getting put together. All right. So what does this mean for us, right? What does this mean for the justification thing? I told you, or I've hopefully convinced you that mathematical proofs are networks and networks with potentially very interesting properties, right? But what does this do for the problem of justification, right? 
what does this do or how does this help us get around this kind of Humean skepticism about believing anything that a mathematician tells you? Because, you know, after certainly after 100,000 steps, you've probably blown the proof of Gödel's last theorem, right? Or, or Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So how do we get, how does the network save us, right? Well, let's, um, let's, let's understand this. Let's rephrase the skepticism as a kind of telephone game, right? So telephone game, it's so I whisper into Edward's you know, ear, Edward hears me, he whispers into Alex's ear and so on down the line, right? Um, think of this as, you know, I toss a coin. The next coin I toss is influenced by the outcome of this coin, right? So, you know, if I get ahead, the chance of getting ahead next is slightly higher than it would have been otherwise. So here's like a sample string, right? Head, oh, I kind of waited me, maybe the next head I got because the first one was ahead, head, head, oh, but you know, tails like shit happens, right? So this is kind of the weak, what we call, call the weak coupling, the noisy telephone game, right? You can make the coupling stronger and stronger and stronger, right? So you can say, oh, heads, you know, really likely to get heads, right? You can keep turning this up and turning this up. The problem is that in the end, you will never get an unbroken string of heads because eventually you're going to just, you know, it's Russian roulette. You're going to get a tails once in a while. This is, I just told you in a very tedious way, the same argument you've just heard about the error probabilities, right? Um, and I've, what I've made explicit here is the fact that these things are happening on a line. So that's the telephone game with coins on a line, right? So it's like I toss the coin, it's just unfolding time T1, T2, T3. Let's play the telephone game on a network, right? So um, what I'm showing you here, this is a lattice, right? So this is a, uh, I think this is a 32, 64 by 64 lattice. Think of each dot on this lattice, each square as either black, meaning heads or true if you like, or tails, meaning false, right? Each node on this lattice is coupled to the node above it, below it, to the left, and to the right. And if the nodes, let's say, to the north and the south, right, above and below are both black and left and right are both black, that makes it more likely than the node in the middle is also going to be black, right? Um, in this case, I've shown you a sample of that lattice uh, where the coupling is pretty weak. So this is kind of analogous to the uh, telephone game in one dimension, right? Um, there's some black, there's some white, but you know what? There's a lot of black next to the white. There's a lot of places where you got heads, like you got that step right, but the next step was wrong, right? Let's turn up the coupling. So now we're going to make it stronger. So just as in the telephone game, we could make it less noisy down the line, we can now couple the, you know, the truth of this node more and more to the nodes uh, that are adjacent to it, right? Make the coupling stronger. We make the coupling very strong, and something strange happens. The entire network, even for a finite strength of coupling, meaning a finite error rate, the entire network freezes in at either all heads or all tails, which is very, very different from what happened in the one-dimensional telephone game. The one-dimensional telephone game, no matter how good you were right, at passing the message down, no matter how low your error rate was, eventually it was going to crack. But in the uh, two-dimensional, in this case, on the lattice, and in general on certain kinds of networks, right, the telephone game, even at finite error rates, can produce a system that freezes entirely in with high probability into the all true, the all heads, or the all false, the all tail state. And that uh, transition point, that error, that critical error rate, all the physicists discover this, they call it critical temperature. Uh, I may slip up when I talk now in the uh, going onwards, right? The kind of weak coupling is high temperature. It's called high temperature. Uh, as you turn down the temperature, that means turning down the error rate. When the temperature goes past a critical point, your error rate is still non-zero, but it's sufficient actually to freeze everything in so that there are no more errors. So what's going on here? This is, by the way, this was invented to understand the solidification of, of gases into solids, liquids into solids. We don't need to get into it. It's a metaphor here from condensed matter. What's really going on, so this is one intuitive explanation. This, this comes from an argument from uh, uh, Eugene Stanley. Uh, the intuitive explanation is, look, in a linear chain, in the sort of early Humean or you know, Kitcherian story about mathematical justification, the influence of one individual on another decays with distance exponentially, right? It's like, I'm going to keep screwing up. Like eventually, no matter how good I am, right? You keep 
you know, driving like that, you're going to hit something, right? Um, so the, the, that each chain decays exponentially, but the nature of the network is such, if the nature of the network is such that as you get further and further away from the other node, meaning as you get, let's say, deeper and deeper into the argument, right, there are more and more paths that show up. So each path is crappier and crappier because it's longer and longer, but there are more and more paths. So the influence of an individual decays exponentially, but the number of possible paths for that influence to travel on can increase. And magically, depending upon the network structure, the uh, number of possible paths can increase exponentially and balance the decrease of the exponential decay. So when these precisely balance, this is this magical critical point, right? And all of a sudden, even though every single deductive path is crappy, right? All of them together, right? There are enough of them that they compensate for the individual crappiness of every path, right? It's a little bit like, how well do I know my friend? You know, how can I influence my friend in San Francisco? Well, any particular chain of influence is really bad, but there are so many different ones that actually he and I can be very, very tightly correlated, right? So maybe that explains, you know, why, you know, everyone, you know, in the country is either in all heads or all tails right now. Um, there's sort of one, one sort of, you know, other piece you want to put in here, right? Here's our, here's, here's Girdle's theorem, right? Um, and uh, here's this sort of rough idea between this node here and that node there along the deductive pathway. Um, I not only go that way, but I can also go this way. So there are multiple things that lead from this node up to this node. Each one of these I might have blown, right? But there are enough of them that actually maybe I might have gotten it right, right? You have the deductive pathways in this direction. There's one last thing you need to put in here before you get this, what we're going to call an epistemic phase transition, which is the possible of what we'll call abductive pathways. So abduction, this is, you know, Charles Sanders Peirce gave us this word. What is it? It's not induction. It's not deduction. It's a third possibility. He's a little ambiguous about what that is. It maybe changes from early to late. Um, uh, one way to think about it is what could be true to make what I currently know true? Um, I should say, this is a great, I learned everything I know about abduction. I learned from this book here, which is um, uh, Umberto Echo and uh, Tom Saviak in uh, Indiana. Here's just an example of how abduction works in mathematics. Um, this is uh, page 379 of Russell's Principia Mathematica. Um, they prove that one plus one equals two. Okay. So why do they do this, right? What if they had failed, for example, to prove one plus one equals two? What if they had proved that one plus one equals three? We probably would have said they screwed up. Right? We would have either said they screwed up in their logical deductions or they screwed up in the idea that what they were talking about was integer addition. Right? What we would not say is like, hey man, rational reconstruction, you know, Russell's good, you know, we believed everything else, there's no reason we shouldn't believe that one plus one no longer equals two. Right? We, that's not what we're going to do. In fact, what we do is we say, you know what, well done, guys. You have successfully proved that one plus one equals two. That's giving me more confidence backwards in the deduction chain. That gives me more confidence in the axioms. Uh, that gives me more confidence in some of these lemmas that seemed a little obtruse to me, right? It gives me confidence that maybe the type theory you invented is not totally bananas, right? Obviously, it's no definitive proof, but that abductive backwards direction seems to play a role in how mathematicians argue and certainly how they justify themselves in their own work. So even in Principia Mathematica, at some point, Russell and Whitehead are talking about the axiom of reduction and they're looked like, why should you believe this? Because like it gives you a lot of stuff that we believe, right? So you should probably believe it. Anyway, once you allow for abduction, i.e. once you allow for bidirectionality here, now all the pieces are in place for you to actually have a epistemic phase transition. You can actually, at a certain finite error rate, go below the critical temperature and the whole thing is believed, even if any particular step is not believed, which is exactly what we want. Henri Poincaré is like, I'm really bad at you know, these sort of tedious little accounting arithmetic deductive steps here. Um, I am, uh, but I'm really good at proving things. Secretly, he's gonna tell you that. So if you look here, if you look on this graph and you know, focus, if you like, on uh, the red line, that's Euclid's geometry, that's the original Greek, right? 
Uh, the dashed line there is the uh, uh, degree of belief you have in the truth of the, and I forget which one, which part of the geometry. I want to say this is the Pythagorean theorem, right? So follow that dashed line there. That's the degree of belief you have in the Pythagorean theorem after it's been proved by in Euclid's geometry. The x-axis is your error rate. So even at an error rate of 10%, if there's a 10% chance that you make an error in any step, you still attribute a near certainty above 99%. So just follow that red dash line up there. It's almost at the top, right? Almost at one. You have near certainty in the outcome. You're actually more confident in the overall network of interacting truths here than you are in any particular truth. There's almost like this, uh, this kind of inversion here where things have flipped. Right, where we believe the proof more than we believe any logical step. Right, so in a funny way, as long as you're willing to add abduction to the rational reconstruction story, we do indeed avoid or potentially avoid the human the human skeptical problem, this sort of paradox of proofs. What you need for that necessarily is that these proof networks have this form. Right, if these proof networks didn't look like this. Right? If they didn't have certain network properties and what they are, like we're working on that, right? But if certainly these are not random networks, it wouldn't work in that case, right? Because these proofs have a certain network structure, they're able to achieve this kind of epistemic phase transition. Um, one fun, I'll tell you two fun things here briefly, and then we can uh, we can go to the Q and A because I know we're 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 a sort of talkative uh, group here. Uh, one thing we noticed is something we call the abductive paradox. So you might think abduction is, you know, it's like a helper, right? A little bit of abduction, you know, it's like salt in your soup, right? It makes it better, right? Um, if you look here, what we plotted uh, in this case, these are two proofs. Uh, left one is the reals aren't countable, Cantor's proof. Um, these lines here are contours of constant certainty. The x-axis is the deductive error rate. So the error rate uh, in going from, you know, uh, assumption to conclusion, right? from you know, uh, axiom to, to lemma. The abductive error rate is going from lemma to axiom, like one plus one equals two, definitely, probably I believe your type theory, right? So that's the abductive error rate. So notice, uh, and then, okay, the contours here you can see, uh, okay, that's like 0.99, that contour of constant certainty and real is not countable. Let me see if I can, my cursor is not for some reason showing up there. Um, so there's something funny about these contours right, which is that they turn over. So check this out. Look at this red line here. That's a, uh, that red line is constant deductive error rate, right? That's like whatever, an error rate of, you know, 2%. As you increase, I'm sorry, as you, yeah, as you uh, increase your abductive skills, right, as you sort of decrease your abductive error rate, uh, so you go up that red line, First of all, your certainty goes up, right? You go from like 0.9 to 0.95 to 0.98 to 0.99. But if you keep increasing the abductive error rate, if you make it too large, you actually start to go down again, right? So it's like you need to balance deductive and abductive inference pathways. Here's what's going wrong in the abductive paradox, right? Essentially, the stuff later, right? is uh, influencing the stuff below. And if you happen to disbelieve the stuff later, that's gonna just kill everything else further down. It's essentially saying there's so crazy, I don't believe it, right? If you're abductive, you know, and maybe some physicists have this problem, right? They believe or disbelieve the conclusion so strongly that they don't actually believe the proof, even though perhaps they ought to, and they should have if they had like a little less confidence in their intuitions. So uh, th this is part of like, the particular balance of abductive versus deductive is interesting, right? The extent to which you have to have abductive certainty, uh, you know, which one do you want to be larger or smaller, right? It seems like the network structure is such that uh, we want better deductive error rates or lower deductive error rates and abductive. But if, if they get out of balance, and it's true, you can also be too deductive, right? If they get out of balance, then uh, you're this kind of certainty that one gets falls apart again. Um, last piece here, um, uh, and I, I gestured at this when I talked about the colors in these network diagrams, right? Uh, one of the things that's kind of fun here is that uh, in all of these uh, proofs, in all of these, in these, in both the machine created networks and the human networks, 
uh, the, the claims cluster into these little subclusters, right? And we've colored them here, right? With these, with, this is the Louvain clustering algorithm finds them. Um, the emergence of these clusters is actually really nice because what it means is that you can get one cluster wrong, or another way to say it is you can be uncertain about one part of a proof and work on the other parts without having to get everything right simultaneously. You can work kind of within a module, get confidence there, and all of the problems from the rest of the stuff, right, are insufficient to overwhelm the certainty you can get from the internal, the argument internal to that module, right? So if you talk to mathematicians, actually they'll, they talk about this all the time, like, look, you know, this part of the proof is working, that part of the proof's not working. So we can like, let's work on this part of the proof there. The very idea that you could separate the proof into two parts that in some sense are tightly interlinked within and sort of weakly linked without so that this could be wrong without totally destroying this. So you could work on this, right? That, that intuition seems to be borne out just by the underlying network structure, again, of this kind of pseudo rational reconstruction. Um, you see these kinds of firewalls in the underlying icing model, but I won't get into this. Um, let me just, I'll finish here. I, I, I shared this, I shared a draft of this paper with a bunch of mathematicians. Uh, mathematicians are lovely. They're like, honestly, they're like elves. They're the sweetest people. Um, so this is Scott Aronson. Scott's actually, he's sort of technically a physicist, but he self-identifies as a mathematician. Um, and I'll just, I'll read you his account of what a proof is to him, right? Um, so for me, a crucial part of that, but we touched on it, uh, in, in your paper is for working mathematicians, says, for working mathematicians, a step-by-step -step logical deduction tends to be seen as merely the vehicle for driving the reader or listener kicking and screaming towards a gestalt shift in perspective, a shift that once you've succeeded in making it makes the statement in question and more besides totally obvious and natural and it couldn't ever have been otherwise. The logical deduction is necessary, but the gestalt switch is the point. So I think this is this gives us, I think, to a certain extent, a, an understanding of how uh, the rational reconstruction is and is not doing things, right? It is, to me, I think, implausible that a mathematician would deny that rational reconstruction is doing something for them, right? What we're trying to get at here is the ways in which the obvious story of rational reconstruction fails, right? This kind of skepticism about proof error, right? But can we rescue that rational reconstruction in a way that accords with intuition, right? In a way that accords perhaps with like what we'd like to come out of mathematics and also potentially the, way, the role that mathematical proof plays in you know, mathematical life, right? So, um, you know, Kitcher has a story, for example, about how mathematics works. He says, look, proof warrants, they aren't really warrants. There's a totally different thing going on. Uh, what we're saying here is that the warrant provided by a network, it turns out, of logical deductions may in fact be good enough, right? As long as you enlarge the practice to include not just the kind of bottom up deduction, but also to allow for this top down abductive pathway as well. So, to be clear, right, no matter how good you are, right, you still need some kind of downward pathway to complete these loops that enable the large scale emergence of truth, even with a weakness at every single point. So in any case, let me uh, end there. I think just on time, Edward, um, and um, hopefully somebody will help me understand how these questions work. Thank you, Simon. There is uh, uh, one of the downsides of uh, Zoom webinar is that there's no clapping, but <laughs> I'm sure everyone is clapping at home. Uh, there's a lot of people who have questions already, and I will promote you to panelist. Nick, you'll be uh, the first one. I can see Nick. Or yeah, I Nick, can hear Nick. Oh, there you go. Ahead. Ah, there we go. Hello. Yes. Hello, Nick. Yes. Perfect. Hey. Uh, so thank you so much for, for this great talk. This was fascinating. Um, so I'm curious about, so you, you, caveated a little bit of the stuff, especially around where you introduced abduction, the notion of abduction, as you know, it needs to be this particular type of proof and it needs to fit the fit the style, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you're you or other folks are looking at other um, types of explanation. So to provide a little bit of context, yeah. uh, I'm interested in the explanations that are given for why 
accidents happen. So let's take like the 737 Boeing Max yep. crashes. And uh, Boeing puts out this explanation of its pilot error. Um, they, they didn't respond fast enough, et cetera, to the automation and the changes in the plane and that yep. caused it to go down. Um, and then subsequent investigations uh, kind of explode that. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, if we, if you or others are looking at ways to right. think about this in other scenarios, basically. No, this is this is a great question. So, I mean, obviously, Nick, you and I should chat offline because you know we're very interested in explanation more generally. Um, to me, I mean, for example, and, uh, and I think we have some of um, of uh, the conspiracy group people online. Um, you know, for us, conspiracy theories are a great example of explanations in that case gone wrong. Um, you know, my sense is, and this is my intuition, that these kinds of networks exist for, obviously, for non-mathematical belief structures. In some sense, like the network of beliefs exists uh, for, you know, the accounts we build of you know, what's going on in the physical world, what's going on in our personal lives, in our social lives. Um, and you know, there's some work on that. So you know, these people who study like legal decision making, and it's like, oh, here's a node. You know, the guy wanted to kill his wife, and here's a node. The guy was probably you know drinking too much to hold the gun steady, and these are interacting. And do we, in the end, does that whole network of interacting claims, uh, you know, fall onto guilty or not guilty, right? So that kind of you know, kind of conceptual network stuff. Um, you know, two, two issues here. One is mathematicians are great, right? Because they actually, like, proofs tell you exactly what they believe and why they believe it, right? So when I say, you know, why, the, why did the 37 Max, you know, crash? I'd probably be like, you know, Boeing, they just lost their edge. I'm not going to expand that for you. So mathematics, in some sense, secretly, right, in addition to, just, you know, to studying one of the great human achievements, math, right, it's also just so happens to be a place where we get this real, you know, X-ray view of a certain kind of belief. Now, you know, if you're a philosopher uh, or maybe a certain kind of philosopher, right? We used to call them analytic philosophers, right? You're a certain kind of philosopher. You believe all things should maybe have this kind of structure, right? Um, in that case, we're able to tell a story about many other kinds of explanations, not just an explanation. And let me put one thing in here, right? Does the proof explain why A squared plus B squared equals C squared? Or does it explain why you ought to believe it, right? I'm actually not quite sure about that. Like, is a proof a moral argument, right, or a material one? Um, but in any case, I, you're, you've given me the opportunity to wing it a little bit here and just to say, yes, like, this is, it just so happens that mathematics gives us uh, the best window on explanations that we've had. So uh, thank you, Nick, for that question. I'll drop you in line as well. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Jonathan. Jonathan Robin. Sorry, give me a second to, there we go. Uh, hi, um, so I'm a mathematician and uh, I'm a little um, bothered by abduction, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, so my question is when you showed this paradox with abduction, um, hmm. it seems to me that this sort of paradoxical aspect depends very strongly on how you define certainty. Uh -huh. And so I'm curious, how do you define certainty there? and I'm wondering if there's almost some circularity built into this. Right. So certainty for us is the degree of belief you put in the final claim of the theorem being true. Right. So um, in the linear case, let's say you believe the axiom is true with 100%. After 100 steps, you're like, shit, the chance that I blew it is, you know, 0.99 to the power of 100, and that's, I'm dead, right? So there's just no certainty there, right? In fact, it's more likely that you blew it at that point. Um, we never reach 100% certainty anywhere here. Uh, technically speaking, a phase transition is only non-analytic in the infinite limit, and Gödel's theorem is big, but not that big, right? So, um, you know, our certainties are hovering around 99%, for example, like within, you know, reasonable levels, right? So if you see like a reasonable kind of, screw up level is 1%. What we're really interested in is when can the confidence in the theorem exceed the individual steps between them? To me, that seems to be the key hump you want to get over, right? If we, how can we get knowledge less fallible than the deductive steps we take on the way there, 
Does that does that help your question, Jonathan? Does that Somewhat. I mean, when yeah. you when you say that you have a ninety five percent certainty, for example, in the paradox, yeah. one of these contours. Yeah. What exactly would that mean? That would mean okay, um, as a <laughs> as a Bayesian with certain beliefs about what you can infer um, from an axiom to a consequence, and certain beliefs about what true consequences imply about the validity of their axiom. So that's the abductive direction, right? Um, given certain beliefs there, and we're gonna parameterize those beliefs about the local steps using these error rates, right? Then uh, you ought to have this degree of belief that the theorem is correct. And then what's, is that, am I, how, how, how am I doing here? Is that, is, that, is that getting closer for you? Yeah. And I'm going to have to go back and think through the paradoxical aspect in light of that definition, because it still seems to me like decreasing error rates should increase certainty. Um, well, so here's, here's the problem, right? So if you're, uh, if you're, so, okay, decreasing both error rates is good, yeah. but decreasing one, like take the Banach-Tarski par uh, theorem, paradox, take the Banach-Tarski theorem, right? Um, it's nuts, right? So it's like, if, if my abduction is too strong, right, then the fact that I don't believe you can cut an orange into two, into two oranges, that is just going to say, you know what, axiom of choice, fuck it, right? It's all shit. I don't believe any of it, right? So that's, that's the kind of paradox there. Now, I can, you know, like, I, I say that to you, I say that can't be true, you must have made a mistake. And you're like, no, I'm really good. AKA my deductive line is good. That's when the battle happens, right? And so you're like, you know what? Your intuition is too strong. Let me up your deductive powers. Okay. That would be kind of the, that kind of intuitively what's going on there. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, Simon, could you do me a favor of getting out of the full screen so that- uh, Oh, yeah, 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 sure. I know you, um, you, you're really tiny, tiny. Uh, and John Norton, the floor is yours. Oh, Simon. Um... Thanks very much. Oh, there you are. Yes. <laughs> I was Hello. looking to see, see you. Uh, uh, this yeah. is terrific. This is a completely new way for me of, of thinking about mathematical proofs and the like, and and and, and very stimulating and and exciting. Um, but but now I'm I, I'm concerned about something. Uh, I want to know: uh, is a particular proof likely to be in error? And mm -hmm. you know, I, so I count up the number of steps, and if there are 100 steps, and there's a 10 percent, you know, or 1 percent chance of error in, in in each case, and so I'm so I'm terribly worried. Right. But in practice, I'm not. And there's a, the reason for it is that when there's a proof in a book, mm -hmm. I know there's a, a further activity. Mm -hmm. I know the mathematician who was working on this has mm -hmm. done all sorts of checking operations. Uh, so take the simple case of Poincaré can't add up. Yes, I can't add up either, mm -hmm. but we do all sorts of checks. Um, accountants have traditionally done the casting out of nines as a way of checking a, as a, way of checking a, 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 a summation. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, when you prove something, you have interesting analogies here. You've got an analogy between what's happening in your systems mm -hmm. and phase transitions. And so right. if some sort of mismatch happens between those, you're going to be alerted to the fact that maybe something's wrong somewhere and you go and, and you go and look for it. There's a huge amount of this sort of external checking activity going on. But what appears in the final book is just one is just one proof. I mean, the extreme example of this is Pythagoras's theorem. Um, you know, go to a, a mathematics book nowadays, it gives you a proof of Pythagoras's theorem, and, and you would think, well, yeah, that, that can't be right, that must be a mistake. There are a hundred proofs of, uh, of Pythagoras' theorem. It's been checked in multiple different ways. So, uh, so I think there, there are these multiple levels. Now, maybe you want to say, all I need to do is expand up, right? And just include that checking there. Well, it's that, th th there, there are two things that go wrong. The first thing that goes wrong is that the original uh, problem depended on independence. Of, of errors and right. independence aren't, this is not definitely not what's happening. Um, uh, that, you know, if you're gonna make an error here uh, uh, and, and, and an error here, they're gonna to have to be correlated in a very particular way. And, and it's, this, it, it, it's this lack of independence amongst errors that, that, that's going to help, you know, you've got to screw up all the way across the board, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before, you're, before you're in real trouble. Um, um, 
Uh, and uh, well, there was a second point, but I, I don't remember what it, what 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 it, uh, uh, what it was now. Um, uh, and so I'm I'm wondering, you, you might still get all this to work in your in your network stuff. There might be things. Uh, okay, I, I've said enough. No, this 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 is this is great, John. I mean, there's there, there's so many sort of different ways into this, right? Um, and uh, I'm gonna probably not. I'm gonna I'm gonna say a bunch of them, and I'll hit the one you had in mind, and we'll see, right? Uh, one of ours, just like this, is social process, right? I believe the Pythagorean theorem because it would be a big scandal if it had been wrong all these years, right? Um, so there's a there's a sort of social process of checking, right? Uh, there's another kind of thing which is this checksum idea, right? Like I can do these kind of spot checks on a theorem such that you know if something had gone wrong, it would have to have gone wrong in some kind of correlated way, right? In order for it to pass the checksum. And I mean, one thing is, one thing I might say in response, right, is haven't you just, you know, uh, stuck another induction on top, right? So it's like, ah, okay, add a new node called the checksum node and all these things go into it. And there's like some checksum calculation that comes out the other side and it now, you know, you know, enters in somewhere else as part of the proof, right? At that point in time, I sort of want to say, you know, sure, any kind of spot checking you want, just put it in my network, right? And we'll see if it's doing the right things. Um, so that's, that's one response. Another response is uh, that, you know, in one sense, the model is symmetric to truth and falsehood, right? Um, you could just as well freeze into the all heads as the all tails case. But once you start to bias the nodes, things get easier. So if you start to believe the axioms, you know, above 50%, once the, you know, if you believe the axioms above 50% and the error rate goes down enough, then the thing will freeze into the all true case. The more nodes you kind of peg by hand, the easier and earlier it is to get into that all true case, right? So you can either think of that checksum move, right, as uh, something within the proof that's altering the network structure to make it easier to freeze in at a lower temperature, which is possible, right? Um, or you could think of the checksum as like an external confidence inducer, right? That sort of fixes some of these nodes is true. It's like definitely you didn't blow that one, right? Because I've done this, you know, I've done some kind of check outside the proof, right? I can fix that. That makes it easier for the rest of the proof to go forward at slightly higher error rates. So I'm not sure, John, if, if any of those three kind of speak to your speak to your question there. Uh, the thing that I'm that I'm worried about is that the larger activity, you know, the proof plus all of the proof checking mechanisms, uh, are designed uh, to detect errors. I mean, you do proofs. I mean, you, 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 I don't know about you know, when I prove stuff. I make mistakes all the time, and I'm just spending all my time trying to figure out where have I gone wrong, what's right, what's wrong, mm -hmm. and I'm and I'm checking and double checking, and I'm checking this and I'm checking that, and eventually, um, um, you know, very, I find the mistakes. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you I found every single mistake, but I, I know that that isn't the case. Uh, but, yeah. the, but the structure is so designed, uh, we build it very consciously. It's a very high priority when you're doing a proof to See, make yeah. the structure as um, as error detecting as you can possibly make it. Right? And that gives me yeah. a great deal more confidence than anything that, 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 that you're saying here. So that conscious design that conscious, is a critical I mean, thing. What, what I'm thinking here about is, um, Lakato is the, the, the Proofs and Reputations book. And I think to a certain extent what you're talking about is the proof construction stage, right? So you hand me a proof and I'm like, John is the kind of guy who builds proofs in such a way that he's gonna detect a lot of errors. I'm interested here, you know, we're kind of focusing a little bit more here on the justification stage. So now I've been handed a proof. It may well indeed have a logical structure that makes it more likely to be true. But in some sense, the construction process that you've gone through is somewhat invisible to me, right? So I do want to, you know, I was talking to Colin Allen about this. And yes, Colin, that's the point. That's yeah. exactly what I said. The proof you see in the book is, is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, so if you're, you know, if, if you're willing to let me split the construction from the justification, then you know we can we can play right. It is definitely the case that you know one person might say, and this isn't true. And like when we were kids, right, doing math class, right, they would be like, "Look, we're going to make you feel the pain of proving this, right?" And proofs and reputations is a great example where the person is being taught the proof by making them prove it. 
Now, not everything goes that way though. And we should, this is great job. Um, I should make sure we should catch other people before I have to go at 125. So thanks, John, great to have you. Yeah, so uh, uh, Simon's in here at 125. So uh, make sure to have so shorter questions. Nick, you're the next one. Yes, so uh, it, it's a bit of a follow-up to John's question because it was very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I want to point out specifically the uh, paradox of proof, the, the probabilistic argument, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think this, this um, questioning about what happens if you do a thousand operation in a row with a small chance of mistake on each one is just, it's just the wrong thing to, to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, give, given the sort of things that John was mentioning, the, the, the question that matters is, what is what is the probability that there will be a mistaken step that will not be caught, right? And if say you ha you have five persons looking at it, what is the the probability that there's a step that the five persons will uh, that that is mistaken and that the five people will miss? And then if you run the probabilities on that, even if there's a ten percent chance that there's a mistake that won't be caught by an individual person, the chance that uh, any mistake will be caught will be massive, right? So it's almost one whenever you have, say, five people look, having a look at the paper or at the proof. So I don't know what you think about yeah, that. No, it seems I mean, to me it's just the wrong arguments that is discussed. There. No, 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 I, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I might say you have a great faith in bureaucracy, right? Um, that, you know, like I passed this form through the system and I mean, 10 people checked it. What could possibly go wrong, right? Um, you know, some people will say, you know, five people in a room are gonna, be, are gonna be more likely to get it right than one person. I'm not so sure. I've been in rooms of five people that are more mistake prone than rooms of one person. So- what, 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 what about the reviewers of the paper? You know, it's not just people talking in a room. I think there's a level of rigor there that- Yeah, that no, I mean, I don't wanna like slag off mathematicians, right? I mean, you know, it's, but, I do want to say that the confidence that purely social processes can give us, right, is not, you know, unbounded uh, from below or whatever, from above, right? But, you know, um, like, let's say, okay, look, five people in a room, they're going to catch more errors than one person. 50,000 people in a room? I'm not sure, right? Um, you know, most of the time, peer review really works pretty well, right? Uh, uh, except when it doesn't, like in Fermat's last theorem, right? Like, you know, my understanding is that even after that got published, there was more work that had to be done. Um, so, you know, my, my sense is not to say, oh, look, it's going to be 10% or 1%, right? But to say, what other, you know, instead of trying to reason about the certainty in a mathematical proof by reference to uh, individuals making a deductive chain, can we somehow look at a different way of justifying that claim? So I don't know, Nick, I mean, I think we're maybe talking a little bit here about, you know, how long can you go, right? And- Yeah, I, I, by the way, I, I like everything you said yeah. later in the paper. Yeah, yeah. I just I just think the motivation is based on, on the wrong worry. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I guess, you know, what keeps mathematicians up at night? Like, are they wrong? Like, I mean, math, they're weird people, right? So, I mean, I think, I think Scott Aronson's um, uh, story is really useful here, right? Scott's like, look, you gotta have this, you gotta have this deductive structure because you're gonna sort of drag people along, you're gonna force them through this. But once they get it, they really get it. And it's something else is going on for them, right? And that's that kind of gestalt shift, right? So, you know, in the end, what causes the gestalt shift? Probably not the belief that the chance of error in the 150,000 implicit steps was low enough. But I mean, Nick, it's something we should you know, chat about, I think, more extensively, because I think we both have thoughts on the, on the larger question. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Adam. Hi, Simon. Thanks for the, the talk. Uh, definitely an intriguing uh, topic. Yeah. I guess I just have a question about the, uh, the, the intuitive match between the sort of proof networks that you were showing us and then the description that you gave us of this like freezing into place with lattices, because it seemed like in the latter case, the intuitive uh, reason you gave us was that, uh, you know, you have uh, weak strength on any given pathway, but you have many pathways. And so in some sense, those mm -hmm. balance out. Mm -hmm. In the proof network though, that you drew, 
each pathway is not its own separate proof from one node to the other. It was like, right. this assumption is used in this lemma, which is a part of this proof of this thing. And it's very weird to me to mm -hmm. think that an assumption that I use in the proof of something is somehow contributing any strength of belief to the truth of that thing. That's like saying, you know, the successor of a natural number is a natural number. That doesn't make me any more confident that four is even than that it makes me that four is, is odd. I need that to be true along with many other things. Yeah. So the yeah. pathways aren't, I don't see how the path, I don't see how the analogy works. The pathways are not individually contributing strength. Right, yeah, no, this is great, Adam. It's a, it's a, really, it's a really useful point. So um, happily, right, um, and we, it's sitting in some appendix somewhere, right? Um, you, can, you can say, for example, that you need all of the assumptions, right? Each, each assumption is not contributing independently, but if you have 10 things coming in, each of them one by one is contributing sort of one tenth of what you need. And that's, that's sufficient to get you the epistemic phase transition, it turns out. The real thing that's giving it to you is these massive alpha groups, right? That, that's the thing that's really enabling all the paths to happen. I guess I don't quite understand what you say when you say one tenth of, of what you need. Like, I mean, is if I was trying to prove that uh, four is odd, right? And, and I construct the proof, and I and as, as a step in that proof, I have that the successor of a number is a number. Is that contributing a fraction of what I need to prove that four is odd? Um, under the assumption that uh, it's a necessary, right? Under the assumption the proof is structured sufficiently cleanly. Right, um, the fact that it is required is part of the thing that's contributing to the your belief in the truth of that thing, and vice versa. Right, so the abductive pathway going the other way. So, so a thing could contribute both to my belief in the proof of P and in my belief in the proof of not P. Um. Yes. Okay, I mean, I have to think about that. That strikes me as very strange. I mean, so bear in mind, right? We only have the true proofs, right? So if you believe the law of excluded middle, right? Uh, either one of the, like, one, the proof is gonna look like one or the other. There's not two separate proofs where in one case P, the other case not P, if I understand you correctly. Um, it's certainly the case that, you know, if you wanna make a claim either P or not P, right? Uh, there are things you may need to assume that are in common, right? Uh, those things need to be true. If they're not true, neither of those claims can be established, even if the claim, and they can be, none of those things can be justified. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Adam. Chidas. Hi. Uh, thanks, Varus. This is a very interesting talk. Uh, I want to ask you about to what extent is your kind of uh, explanation capture the way in which mathematicians often talk about their uh, beliefs and proofs. So if you find, if there's a new proof, uh, a new candidate proof for a conjecture like P versus NP or Goldbach's conjecture that comes out, mm -hmm. often you see that mathematicians very quickly, even before really reading the paper, figure out that it's unsuccessful because they'll say, well, it uses such and such technique and we know that such and such technique is very unlikely to work right. in that kind of, right? Or or if the, and also similarly, this also gives them confidence for why they believe in certain conjectures very strongly without proof, such as P versus NP again, mm -hmm. because they know that all these techniques to try and disprove them have sort of uh, barriers that prevent them from um, right. disproving it. And there are sort of network connections with other conjectures that they have more reason to believe perhaps. So. I guess I'm sort of curious about whether this way of thinking about proofs in the abstract in terms of techniques and uh, sort of structures mm -hmm. is a consequence of this kind of error-ridden deductive process that we humans have. And so sort of uh, the contrapositive is, suppose if we did not have, suppose we were ideal reasoners in some sense, we did not make mistakes in deductive steps right? Would we not develop this kind of abstract pictures of what the, what mathematics is like? We wouldn't think in terms of techniques and sort of, would it be a much more boring subject in a way, right? Because we wouldn't right. have, have think, this. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, this is great. I think, this, I mean, this, this hooks into uh, the, the uh, exchange John and I had um, about the difference between proof construction and, and then sort of reading the proof later, right? Understanding the proof is something you make and then uh, the ways in which the proof justifies the belief to you, right? Um, so, you know, somebody presents me with a proof that P is, you know, equals or not equals NP. Um, I think Scott Ironson said this, like, here's like a couple of reasons why I won't read the proof, right? One reason is that um, it's like category theory is just way not powerful enough to prove this. Like, it's just too wimpy, right? So these are kind of intuitions that uh, I would say live in the world of proof construction, right? What Scott's saying is, all right, let me imagine proving this with category. Theory. No, just not powerful enough. I think that's why Scott is saying, I don't believe that, right? Um, so some of those intuitions there, you know, we, 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 we can't speak to the, um, to the construction stage, right? And I think, you know, this is the nice thing that we've sort of discovered in philosophy of mathematics. You've got to kind of tease these two things apart. Proof as warrant versus proof as, you know, the final object of a discovery process. Um, the, uh, there it is sort of sitting there, right? So let's say I am given a proof that P equals not equals MP, right? And it does use category theory. Um, instead of treating this as a story, okay, here's how I tried to prove it, and then believing or disbelieving it because I don't think a proof can be constructed that way. What if I actually, you know, attempted to, you know, verify the proof if I actually read it, right? So I think what Scott says is I won't even read the proof. But like, what well, he did read the proof. Um, you could certainly have these kind of meta ideas that, okay, look, this cluster here, that's the category three cluster. I know that the links of the category three cluster to the computational complexity cluster can't work. So there's got to be a mistake there. That's that kind of intuition is not in our in our story. So I don't know if this if this is speaking to to your concerns. I think there's uh, but sorry, go on. Yeah. Oh, no, I was going to just ask. Yeah, my concern was, yeah, I guess you answered it. You're basically saying it's not sort of speaking to that. I guess my concern was something like or uh, would. Yeah. So would that way of thinking about mathematics is that a consequence of this uh, way of getting warrant in uh, conclusions that you have sketched with a kind of abductive and a deductive axis? Uh, and yeah, but but you seem to be saying that that's sort of different because that's the constructive process and not the justificatory process. I, okay. I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, I think if, if, I'm, if I may interrupt, we should probably leave it here because we still have a few points of queue. I'd like to give at least one or two of them a chance to get that in. If I, if I uh, may, Edward, let me just suggest something, which is I know Patrick, Mack, and Colin sort of offline socially. So maybe we can take Mike's question. All right. Uh, and then Patrick and Colin and Mac, and we can, you know, we can chat separately since we just happen to hang out outside of Zoom. So You are you are muted, Edward. Sorry. Mike, floor is yours. See us. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. And uh, thanks. I feel flattered. Um, you feel flattered that I don't know you socially. Uh, hey, let me cut the line. <laughs> on, sorry, I'm teasing. <laughs> no, so I, I enjoyed this. Um, something that I think a lot about, or at least a little about, is um, issues of proof purity and intuitive content and the like, uh, and something that struck out at me of the, really the, the, the pictures of the networks that you were throwing up onto the screen mm -hmm. was the following. And I was wondering if I could just get your sense that I'm sort of thinking about this in a productive parallel way. Um, I can imagine roughly speaking that where there are going to be firewalls, we have uh, domains that have some intuitive content about them and moreover have the sort of network structure that you're still trying to figure out what features precisely. But I can glue these together and imagine more complicated uh, impure proofs mm -hmm. that presumably are going to violate whatever network statistics are going to ensure that you get this sort of mm -hmm. uh, certainty. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is, do you think this framework can speak to that subject where there's a sense in which impure proofs are going to wind up less certain if we understand them in that setup? This is, this is great. I mean, um, it's a wonderful question. And the, 
the one example we might have or that we would have had would be the four color theorem. So the four color theorem is sort of controversial because it was proved by machine or with the aid of machines. Um, you know, some mathematicians said, you asshole, you've killed the four color theorem forever. No one's ever going to produce an elegant proof of it now, right? Um, you know, everything else like Riddle's incompleteness theorem, all these other theorems, when they wrote the code, when they wrote the code, they basically followed the structure of the proofs that we already knew, right? And the four color theorem, this was this kind of weird cyborg thing, right? Where you might have thought that they didn't quite have these firewalls in place simply because the discovery process was in part completely automated, right? So my sense is, for example, the epistemic firewalls appear in part because of how people actually make proofs. They're like, let's handle the number three part first, then we'll get the topology part, okay, glue them together, but hopefully just weekly, right? We have everything is combining here and combining there. So the hope would be that something in the four color theorem would break that, right? I don't know if, I mean, it doesn't over the overall statistics, it doesn't, it has the same level of modularity. Um, if you look at the network diagram, there's a couple weird things like you're like, ooh, that's weird. Like just visually, it doesn't look like the other ones. Um, but I think you're totally right that, you know, uh, if there were such a thing as an impure theorem, meaning there was no kind of modularity to it, uh, I think your intuition is my intuition, which accords with this story we're telling here, right? Which is that mathematicians would be like, oh, I'm not so sure about that. There's so many different pieces and I can't separate them out well enough to tell what's going on there. So I don't know, Mike, if that, if, 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 if that's, are you a philosopher or a mathematician? What's your, where are you coming from? Um, philosophy side. Ah, okay, got it. Yeah, I mean, the, um, we were reading, I mean, in order to do the paper, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Let me just look at the site here. Um, uh, he's one of these famous mathematicians who also, uh, Terry Tao. Uh, so Tao, I, I'll just, I'll, he mentions this on, uh, what's the, the title of his blog post is on local and global errors in mathematical papers and how to detect them, right? And so he has this notion of a local error, which is something that can be fixed, right? The problems don't propagate as far as a global error, which is sort of much more dramatic, right? The local error, yes, there's a mistake here, but you know what, like, there's so many other true things around it that it can prop through morally true, right? You can't fix it, right? But there's other things potentially, and you might think, for example, bridges between modules. If the bridge fails, right, then there's not enough to keep that, to keep these two things together. So, you know, then at that point, the firewall actually now becomes like a gulf, right? And even if the stuff is fixable, needs you think the proof itself has been done. So I don't know, Terry might have a good thing there. It, the fun thing about this work is that it's you can you sort of go back and forth between these intuitive reports and the actual stuff that happens. Um, you know the difficulty I think is and, and uh, this is John's you know and come up before right is the proof construction phase, right? You don't want to mix proof construction with the sort of justificatory part. So, anyways, like thank you, Edward. We may we may I just so I can get to Iowa. To yeah. Get my so. Uh, 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 unfortunately, Simon has to give another talk in five minutes, so uh, we will have to stop here. I apologize for those of you uh, in the queue. Thank Simon, you thanks again for this wonderful lecture. That was really, really very exciting, uh, exciting talk today. So um, I just have a, I have a question. Eric. Um, do I get an umbrella? Everyone is asking this question this semester. You will get an umbrella next time we see you. Okay, good. Thank you. It's, a, it's, an, it's an honor. Thank you very much. And uh, people should draw me a line as they please. So thank yes. you much. Right. Yeah, feel free to reach to Simon. Bye. Thanks, Simon. And see Thank you down. next week for two lunchtime talks. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye. -bye.